I am certainly. been asked by the bees in the past, and, and in my general capacity as a rugby analyst, I have tried to examine them. What have the bees contributed to rugby football? How will they be remembered in the annals of, of, of rugby history? I've looked at several aspects. Could it be through the captains they've had? I, I've heard it said that uh, Egan and Joy were both cult figures. Now, I, I would agree with that. They were a right pair of cults as far as I was concerned. Um, I also think their line-out tactics are most interesting. In Barbieri, they produced the first line-out jumper who ever successfully jumped downwards. But the one that sticks in my mind was from Amsterdam. I have been known in rugby as a coach who has believed in starting with a back three rather than a front three in line with the great French coaches. I was brought up in the days of Vilpre, Cantoni, Daraway, etc. Later copied by Wales with JPR, JJ and Gerald Davies. Then I went to see the Bees and I saw the back three of the Bees in Amsterdam comprising Thompson, O'Hara and O'Connor. <laughs> I well conduit. remember oh, names, names a conduit. Names a conduit, yes. I name. well remember giving two of them prizes, mm. team awards, after the last game of the tour in Amsterdam. And I was totally fair about it. Uh, by the way, I, I gave Steve. both the prizes to Catholics, uh, one would remember, and my Protestant yes. friend did not receive one. Sorry, perhaps I should have mentioned this evening, just in case anyone's the wrong impression, uh, but this jersey I'm wearing, uh, it is not an Irish trickler that I have around me. Um, it is like the fact the Springbok jersey, which I thought was suitable for the uh, occasion, but I thought I'd better say something about the colours in case the, uh, the um, Grand Master of my Orange Lodge gets to see this video. But Mr. Hunter, I don't suppose, can I interrupt at this point, I don't suppose any point in telling you that this is not a sectarian conversation. Would that be wasted breath? I suppose it would be wasted breath, wouldn't it? No, no, no. no, 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 no. Carry on. Carry on, please, John. Just, please, just uh, carry uh, on. Uh, I never, yes. ex I never expected yes. this to be a sectarian conversation or even a sectarian video. As far as I know, no jungle bunny has yet played for the bees. And that perhaps <laughs> is one <laughs> of the ways in which they may go down in the annals of, uh, of rugby history. But I come back to Amsterdam. And one of the highlights of my career was watching that famous trio of daredevils operate at the back. Danny got a tour award Wonderful. for some of the best cross kicking that I've ever seen from an Irish player in my life. And I remember a wonderful kick ahead was the highlight of that game. And every single oh, one indeed, led instantly to opposition tries. Absolutely impeccable, really, I suppose you say. Impeccable. The impeccable. judgment was unerring. unbelievable. Unerring, yes. O'Hara. Danny recognises this. Better games. Yes. I obviously picked the wrong day. Mm. A horror's ability to catch forward passes I have never seen equal in the history of left wing play. And a horror would consider himself a better left winger than virtually anybody. Oh, Even Pope Paul. He's not a he's not a winger <laughs> really. He's a he's a, a dancer. He's, he's, I accept that as expression of uh, he's a dancer. He's a dancer. He likes to play in the centre. I remember his heyday was he and Niall Hayden. That was a, another name from the distant past. That's, yes, that's a long, long time ago. But I think to talk about one of them, uh, when I remember that back to you, to talk about one of them in isolation is unfair. One has got a group them together, and here perhaps is something that the bees will bring forward to the future of rugby football, where they have revamped the idea of a back three. I'm not too sure how you would describe it. Back three? Back three? Back three? Back three I leave three. that to future historians of rugby football. Indeed. 
But the well, greatest thing about the, yes. the bees really is, is, is the mix of people and the unpredictable uh, that occurs. It don't, I think it happens every match, certainly the one like it. Yes, I'm not saying. Particularly where Doc McDevitt is playing, of course. When Doc is around, you can be sure of surprise. Oh. But everyone's capable of the, uh, the art of the flash of, of something different. Well, let's just call it the odd flash burner, you know, because <laughs> what it is, sometimes we don't know, but would you say in the end that uh, this was a great team? Uh, well, that is a great team in some ways. Do you think it, do you think, how would you describe it, Ben, as the captain that came and went and saw it at, a, at his, one of his golden moments? How, how would you encapsulate yes, it? I, well, I, 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 I came and went to do a certain job yes. is how I viewed it. Um, you have to be able to be laughed at when you're doing something like that. And certainly, I hope a few people had a few laughs at my expense. And that was the intention. Yes. Uh, but we, we got the thing uh, new motivated. Um, I comfort myself that since then, team had gone through a little bit of instability and it came together again. It's toured every year since then. And whenever you look at a collection of people, I look at the photograph of the bees, you name me 35 individuals. Yeah. But of such a selection of personalities that have also directed themselves good fun, a good company to play rugby and sing and dance and pass it together. It's an experience. It's an team. It's an experience. Well, Brendan Healy, I don't think that you have to comfort yourself because, in fact, after that great beginning, that great insight that Egan had, you were the man that, in fact, did get it on his feet, initiated the first mini-tour that was our dinner. And since that we've been to Amsterdam, Lisbon, Madrid, Paris, and next year to Bordeaux, I believe. So in fact, I think you've got a great deal to be proud of in your little role as that sandwich captain between these two juggernauts, Egan and Tommy Joy. And of course, there's another juggernaut come along, Jerry Ryan. And, uh, He's doing a lot of things, but the bees are changing as well, and maybe some of us are getting a bit too old to participate too much in that change and have to rely on our, our backward-looking memories. Yeah. But they were great memories, and remain great memories, and I think this video will be one of the things that sustains our memory for a very long time. But a memory is any memory, and the most important thing is that we are continuing to go forward. And good luck to you. In a backward kind of way. Yeah. We'll be carping on the sidelines. That's right. <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> and a last word from you, John. The uh, future of the bees uh, in rugby terms. And, I mean, as an expert in rugby, you know, you're, you're, you're there for your expertise as well. The, that is a paradoxical question because, by definition, the bees never have a future, only a past. But I would like to just come back to one point that uh, you bring up with Brent on a sandwich roll. And again, I say if I draw an analogy here, it was sandwich between Joy and Egan. And all of us know which you'd prefer, the bread or the filling. Uh, I leave that again to future historians. Well, I'm a, my last word on that is whatever kind of sandwich it was, it certainly wasn't a chicken sandwich. <laughs> Excellent. Tom McIntyre, you want to meet McIntyre? You might McIntyre. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, then he's showing me around in flats, you know, he's got so much bloody sound equipment and stuff down there. But get him to put on a, an interview of Clara Wilson before he goes on television and will tell him exactly what the guy's all about. Because this is a pre thing and they had the tape on it. 
And uh, the interviewer is saying, well, uh, this is a sort of format for questions. And, you know, it was like a fucking wall spec in the corner. And he was screaming. Come in and shut his stupid ass. That's how dirty he comes out of our lungs. Interesting stuff, huh? So where do you go from here? Well, the bees then. The bees. What, what I want to do is go back into history. I see this. Back in the 70s. Yes. Well, I, want to go, I want to go back into history and find out the beginnings of the bees. I mean, how did the bees come about? <coughs> they were so, fucked out as a day or two, too. Did right? you tell me to be a bee? What's that? Another revolution after the love of life. What do you do? Facebook. Show us who. Well, no, the bees as they were. How did they? How did the whole institution come into existence? Well, I mean, I, mean, I, I know, but not a proper bee side. I mean, the bee side that originated with Egan's land. Well, like, for, for example, was it an evolutionary thing? Did it just evolve like Darwin, or was it was it a Big Bang theory? I mean, did you did, Big did, Bang? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you think up? I mean, no, no, did no. You think up the bees as a? No, as an I certainly did not. No, no, they just grew up. What what happened was in. Uh, uh, yes, I was 19, it would have been 19, four, 60, no, 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 1967 it was, 1967, I was then 26, and I decided to, uh, Louis Rhodes, people like that were still around, and uh, we, uh, the A2 side didn't have a captain. So I thought it'd be a good idea if I if I put myself forward and, and like all these things, uh, I put myself forward. There wasn't anybody else, so uh, I ended up with the captaincy of the uh, A2 side, A2 side, which I then ran for uh, one whole year. Fascinating enough, but typical London Irish. I had every intention of doing it the following year, but what had happened was <laughs> I got a. I got a clot on my left, right leg, true story. I was down at Clapham South Station. I was on my way up to town. I didn't meet Tessa Moore at the time, who was my <laughs> damn lady. And my leg gave up. So I rang my sister and was quickly taken down to St. James's Hospital, where they banged me into an open ward, expecting me to die at any moment. Pat Tracy was my only visitor, but not to see me, to borrow a few pounds from me. <laughs> but that was it, because Tracy says, you don't need this money when you're in here, Daz, and I suppose that's dead right. <laughs> <laughs> was Peter Whiteside behind the no, 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 behind the plot? In that time, not the plot, man, no, the plot. in that time, there was a chap called Dave Craig, and he used to be the sort of team secretary. And we always used to have meetings before meetings, and of course, I didn't attend the meeting before the meeting purely and simply because I was stretched out in St. James's Infirmary. As I hadn't shown up, I was automatically assumed I didn't want a captain aside the following year, whereupon it went to a guy called Mike Beckett, who was always more dangerous to his people who That's were right. playing with than he was to the opposition. A fly fisherman. Yeah. <laughs> he was indeed a fly fisherman, yeah. But he could get 15 people in his motor car, so he had some benefits. So that was kind of the end of me, and I was floating around for a while. And then I think about two, two or three years after that, I think other people were involved. Yes, there was, uh, I think after Beckett. Oh, yeah, then they split the side, didn't they, into sort of three sort of A sides. It was a sort of a A1, 2, 3 arrangement. Mal Hines, I think, was one of those, and he came on the scene for a while. And he was preceded, I think, by uh, Brendan Healy. And then I came back on the scene again about a good seven years after the original running the A2 side and picked it up again because there wasn't anybody around. That was very, very unsuccessful. And Jerry Holland was then running the, I think it was then called the, uh, uh, what he used to call them, the B Specials. And I was, he had a better side than I have. And of course, Jerry used to always say, you know, I'd be trying to pick players down from him. and. He'd say, oh, well, they won't play for you. So, I mean, I was in a kind of a limbo situation where no players were coming down. And anything that could have gone up didn't go up because it was, wasn't allowed to go up. Well, what about this? So, at the end of the year, at the end of the year, this is, this is how it came around. In the wisdom, as we were getting older, they said it'd be much better if Jerry Holland ran the A2 side, which was then the fifth side in the club. And we, as a group, would drop down to be the B side on the seventh side. And one couldn't argue about that, so that's how it came about. So that would have been 1974, I think.
Well, what about the special characteristics now of the bees? In the essence of the bees? Uh -huh. Egan's line. How do, you, how do you account for that? The best known side in the club. Uh, quite simply, I think all I did was I got what I consider to be the best heads around me in terms of entertainment. I mean, I never really saw it as a rugby side. I would see it as a circus. <laughs> I think it's more of a circus. I wanted performers, actors and actresses, singers, dancers and so on. And rugby was largely uh, coincidental, really. I think that's what made it go, yeah. That's why Tommy Joy... But I didn't Joy actually... I didn't purposely sit down one day and write out a list of names. Uh, I think I, just over the years, we seem to attract the right kind of heads, but that, that kind of thing happens. So, I mean, it wasn't created in that sense, it evolved, I suppose. What about, what about the great moments in the bees' days now? I mean, I remember one great moment of yours, which modestly, I'm sure, would for, what for, is that? forbid you to, to mention. The day, down, the day down in Purley when you scored three tries. And indeed, you would have scored a fourth and a fifth try had not some brother on charge or a man on the side shouted, don't give the fucking ball to Egan. Quite, and quite the last right. Minutes, but, uh, <coughs> You're actually, no, I did score four tries that day, not three, and had I scored five, that would have been a record, but then something that I wouldn't be entitled to, really, in, in uh, pure modesty. But anyway, that was that. <laughs> but other great, was for, was other great for. moments apart from that, man. Any great moments to Not so out. much Which on the field. Moments, or non-sporting moments. Well, non-sporting moments, I suppose. I suppose having the having made that crack about uh, uh, what you call them Blackburn, I suppose that was a kind of a highlight in the sense that we managed to get round the world. I mean, when Danny O'Connell used to check these games out with me on uh, on Friday, and he used to, I think, he, he would do the three quarters, and I would do the forwards, and uh, that way we didn't have to make fifteen calls. He would be responsible for half the side, and I was responsible for the other. And I had in those days, having done a hard day's work on Friday, I had a habit of making myself a, a large Irish coffee at about four o'clock and then check the side out. So that when I hit town at 5.30, I'd be in reasonable form, having got the side done and everything else together. So we're checking the side out this particular day, and Blackburn being a, a priest and also an old solution, so he was Danny's contact, or Danny was his contact. So anyway, we were going through the side this day, and we started off with the forwards, front row, second row, and we got into the second row, and Blackburn's name came up, and Danny said, the other end of the phone, he said, no, no, he said, uh, Blackburn, he said, is not available. And I said, why? And he said, because, <laughs> because he said he's not fit. And I said, well, that's very strange. I said, he was perfectly okay last week. I said, what happened? So. And then he said, well, he didn't injure himself on the field, he said. He said he injured himself saying mass. He said he was taking his vestments off and then pulling the vestments off over his back. He said he slipped a disc in his back. <coughs> Whereupon I said, well, you can tell Blackburn from me to make his mind up whether he wants to say mass or play rugby. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing about that little remark, I hadn't really any thought any more about it, but <laughs> it was then written up in the, in the program and it was a... The following week, we had quite a, a good sort of home game, and people like Michael Green came down, and we managed to make all the sort of Sunday papers, and then it was sort of syndicated all around the world. And for years, for years, I used to have people coming up to me saying that uh, they'd seen this thing in the sort of Donegal Chronicle and the Toronto uh, Express, etc., etc. And also we made radio too, because the following Monday after Green's visit to Sunbury, he was, um, he was Pete Murray's guest on a program called Open House. And Murray naturally enough said to him, well, you know, you're a serious commentator on rugby, but you've also written all these amusing books. And he said to him, well, where do you get your material from? Whereupon Green said, it's funny you should say that, he said, but I was down at Sunbury, said London Irish that Saturday, and related this story. So I thought that was quite good. It upset Kennedy no end because, in a sense, we had got far more, far more, far more publicity in one few seconds than he ever got in his whole life. But uh, I would hope one day, I mean, with the aid of Terry Thompson, who suggested if we could get all these various paper cuttings and uh, bang them onto a glass cage in Sunbury, it'd certainly be a bit of fun, would it not? What about some of the characters, then? <coughs> Well, they're all characters, and I can't say anyone in particular. They're all, all great heads. 
All right, but all tell, great tell, tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us about your own demise. <coughs> There's still a lot of controversy about this. <laughs> where you, where you, where you pushed, or did you fall? I mean, I've consulted some of the archives, and there's still a lot of, still a lot of controversy. And I mean, the, the name Brandon Healy keeps coming up in conversation. Yeah. Right? But can we have it? Can we have it ready from the horses, right? What happened? <coughs> well, the way I would say it myself, Healy is one of these guys who always feels that things in life have to be changed, and. Uh, I have a different point of view. I like letting things stay as they are. But uh, Healy, I think, has uh, decided that I had to go for some reason because he thought that if I had gone, then the the uh, the B side would have a have a better future, kind of bring it into the 1980s, I suppose. But uh, I don't think he was too successful at doing that. I think really I had to go, it didn't upset me too much, and of course I gave them a golden opportunity that Saturday when I saw my secretary in Nightingale Lane and decided to go off and spend the day with her. But that was largely because... <laughs> <laughs> but that was largely because Healy had got onto my skin at that stage, and I thought to myself, well, if I can spend the afternoon with the secretary of the day and have a few jars, rather than listen to Brendan Healy, I think... <laughs> I think a lot of people may have the same point of view. I think I made the right decision. Uh, and after Brendan Healy, there came uh, Tommy Joy and now Jerry Ryan. Would you like to comment upon those two successors of the B team captains? Well, Healy didn't want Joy to be captain at all, and had it not been for me, he wouldn't have been captain, because I think there's a certain amount of bad blood between uh, B. Healy and T. Joy. <laughs> and I certainly won't comment on that. So, uh, what I mean as as captains, really, does you know, and uh, captains of the beast. Do you mean you think they were true and proper successors? I'd say I think Joy was a better successor in many respects than Healy. Healy I find slightly too autocratic, really. But then a lot of men who are five foot four feel like that. <laughs> and uh, I mean, when you're born good looking, intelligent and fit, it may appear to be advantage, but a lot of people want to do you down, yeah? Is Brandon Healy one of those? I don't know. <laughs> You've been on some good tours, haven't you, Des? You went to Dundalk with the bees. Yeah, yeah, that was true. That's, <coughs> that's why you picked up that bird with a leg and a half. <laughs> a leg and a half? I don't remember that. Hmm. Well, Paul, we come to an end, don't we? OK, whatever you like. No more questions. Well, I suppose, I suppose it must end with the, with, with the future, Des. I mean, now we've got <coughs> the Americans bombing Libya, and we've got Nuclear, nuclear activity and clouds coming over from Russia. I mean, do you think there's a future for the bees? Yeah, I, I don't think radiation will affect them too much at all. Very good, very good. Very good. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, how much have you filmed already? I mean, you're off now, yeah? Oh, we've got to get to Tommy first. Tommy, Tommy. This would be great stuff. I have a team. How many camps have you taken all together? About three or four. No, he's taken a lot. I don't know. He's taken, he's taken various matches and games over the years. Mm -hmm. And last year as well, didn't he? No, I didn't make any last year. Did you not? Okay, well, let me already do it. Right, we'll just keep talking nicely. <laughs> Tony, no, seriously, when did, when did you first...